The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Come on, sing, who can imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is Church, aren't you grateful for the power of the work of the cross? Come on. That is amazing. Well, it is so good to see you all. Man, you're here. I'm here. We're all here. We're going to have a good night, right? 
All right, awesome. Well, so good to see you. My name's Nick. I'm one of the pastors here on the staff. I get to oversee our college internship here. And I want to say welcome to all of you with us. And I want to say welcome to you as well. If you're tuning in online, thanks for joining us. In fact, if this is your first time tuning in, we want to say thank you. In fact, we want to hear from you. Wouldn't you drop us a line? Email us at contact at manna.church. Let us know how we can serve you. But for those of you in this room, if this is your very first time to Mana Church, we want to say welcome welcome. You're our honored guest. In fact, we want to give you something for free. And here's how we do that. If this is your first time to Manor Church, just look at the back of the seat in front of you. Go ahead and take out those, those two cards that are right there. And even right now as I'm talking, you can start to fill out that very first card you see. It says guest card. You know, in just a moment, we're going to start passing some offering buckets. But if this is your first time to Manor, rather than any financial contribution, we would just ask that you place that guest card all filled out in the bucket as it passes you. That's all that we'd ask. That's as hard as it gets. And then secondly, you'll notice that other card right behind it. It says first impressions. And really, we just want to know how did you enjoy the worship experience with us? So you can jot down some comments. And then afterwards, go find someone after service in an orange shirt that says here to serve. Those are our serve team members. We would love to get to meet you, say hello, but also we can exchange that card for just a small token of our appreciation to say thanks for coming. And we genuinely hope to see you come back next week. So Man's Church, let's do what we do. Make our guests feel welcome. Yeah, that's awesome. Speaking of next week, how many of you know we've got a big birthday next week, and that's the birth of our country, right? That's Independence Day. It's 4th of July. Come on. Come on, somebody. Well, anybody got some 4th of July uh, plans? You're going to go see some fireworks? Going to go out of town? Anybody, right? Well, that's why we're not going to have service next Thursday night. We're going to cancel Thursday night, and we're going to move it to Wednesday night. Everybody say Wednesday. Wednesday night. So go tell your kids, tell your husband, tell your wife, tell everybody out there. Wednesday night service is happening next week. Same bat time, same bat place. We'll see you there. Uh, but for right now, let's go ahead and put our hands together one more time as we receive the offering. Yeah. By the way, if you're online and you'd like to give, you can cl click the link right below. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for who you are. You're so, you're so good to us. You're so faithful to us. God, we cheerfully give back to you right now. We return our tithes. We give our offerings. We ask that you would bless everything that's given to advance your kingdom here in the local area and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every believer has a calling. It's time to get ready. Grace College of Divinity is an accredited and nationally recognized Bible college dedicated to preparing emerging Christian leaders. We offer certificates and degrees in divinity, Christian leadership, worship ministry, and intercultural studies. All of our graduate programs focus on leadership and biblical studies. Also, our Master of Divinity degree is accepted for military chaplaincy. Whether your goal is preparation for ministry or personal development, GCD's on-campus and online classes offer the flexibility that you need. Together, we can change the world. National Serve Day is coming up fast. On Saturday, July 13th, hundreds of churches in dozens of countries all on the same day will be serving their communities. So to show the world the love of Jesus in practical ways, Mana Church will participate by doing outreaches all along the military highway. To sign up to participate in a drink giveaway, car wash, or any of our other outreaches, head over to our website at www.mana.church, download the Mana app, or visit the outreach kiosk at your site. Being the church means loving people, and you, Mana Church, do an amazing job at this. Let's partner with hundreds of churches across the globe and make it hard to go to hell in our region, along the military highway, and around the world. Now, let's go change the world together.
Hey everybody, by now you know we're launching a brand new site in Hope County. We're calling it the Rayford site. We're so excited. Our first interest meeting was a smashing success, lots of momentum. We've got a brand new interest meeting coming up on June 30th. So it's gonna be after the 1230 service at Cliffdale. So whatever site you attend, whatever service you go to, on that day, on June 30th, come to the Cliffdale site, attend the 1230 service. Immediately afterwards, we're gonna feed your family lunch. We're gonna talk about what God is doing. It's gonna be exciting. I'm gonna be there. I hope you're gonna be there too. God bless you. See you then. Hey, I want to say hello to our friends and family all around the Fayetteville, Cape Fear region who attend Manor Church or just live around here watching on the internet. Maybe you're at Hope County Correctional. Come on, somebody, give it up for them. Maybe you're in Florida, Hawaii. Maybe you're in Thailand, wherever you are. We love you. Come on, let's make them feel welcome. Yeah. We're in the middle of a series entitled 10 Talks Accelerate Your Growth, and we're studying the Ten Commandments, but not just studying the Ten Commandments, really the question that's on the table is this. Is it possible that the world's most famous list of do's and don'ts is really not just do's and don'ts, but the steps to a, a pathway, as it were, to your better future, to your calling and your destiny? And, and I, I guess you know, since I asked that question, you know that that really must be what it's all about. And we're going to look at that more deeply in just a moment. But see, the truth is that God's a creator. God's the author of life. And he knows how he, he knows where the, the steps of life are, and, and he knows how to create in us um, that abundant life so we can walk in joy and passion and, and righteousness, and we can live out the blessings of God. That's what he wants for us. We have a good God. He loves us. He's not withholding. He's not holding back. In fact, these commandments are pathways, doorways into a brighter future. And so here we are. In, in the commandment number eight. Real simple, thou shalt not steal. Let's go home. <laughs> yeah, it's really simple, right? Maybe it's a little deeper and a little more complicated than that. Let, let, let me read a quote to you. In a survey taken by George Barnes several years ago, 86%, that's a lot of people, 86% of adults claim that they completely satisfied God's requirements of abstinence from stealing. In other words, they don't steal. They haven't stolen. It goes on to say, thou shalt not steal is a good word for thieves and robbers, we think, and doesn't have a thing to say to ordinary people. The commandment, thou shalt not steal, is really a whole lot bigger than just those words. Just the letter of the law. All throughout this series, we've been looking at the letter of the law, which is pretty clear, but the spirit of the law is always higher than the letter of the law. So there's probably something lurking in these few words that really is, is, not, is not nefarious, it's not dangerous, it's not a problem, it's not God's trying to crush us, but somewhere in these words, there's a key to unlock something you and I need in our lives. And, and it's not hidden, it's not buried, but it's found not in the letter of the law, but in the spirit of the law. Remember that? We talked about the spirit of the law. And an example would be, um, you shouldn't murder somebody. And, and that's pretty obvious. But Jesus talks about that in the New Testament. Now, thou shalt not murder is found in Exodus 20, but in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, Jesus references it again. Watch this in verse 21. You've heard that it was said of those of old, that's in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. Verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty of the judgment. Wow. In other words, behind all murder, there starts with anger. And what about lust? We looked at lust, um, was it last week? 
In Matthew chapter 25, verse 27, just a few verses down from what we just read a moment ago, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman, watch this now, with lustful intent, that means in his heart, in his heart, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Living a life of devotion to God is is more than just doing and not doing. It's deeper than that. It's about being. It's God wants to change us from the inside out, not the outside in. He, he's not looking for you to master perfect obedience so your insides will magically change. That's not what it's about. He wants to transform our heart so we can walk in his pathways. So it's not just about the abstinence from the act of sin. It's about your heart. Are you being transformed into the image of God? That's what it's really all about. So in the same way that there's a letter of the law and the spirit of the law, the same applies to this statement, thou shalt not kill. It's much more than, than just not taking stuff that doesn't belong to you. I know that's a double negative. I did it on purpose. It's more than just not taking stuff that doesn't belong to you. It's bigger than that. It's about, now listen to this, get this. It's about integrity and generosity. And I'll show you how in just a couple of moments. But first of all, we're probably stealing more in the 21st century than we've ever stolen. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if, you're, if, you, if you don't steal. Because I know if I say, okay, how many people obey thou shalt not steal? Almost every hand would go up and every one of you would be lying. Which means you're really going to need next week's message because it's about not lying. So it's perfect. God, God the Ten Commandments said, let's say thou shalt not, thou, thou shalt not steal. He said, oh, we've got to add one. You can't lie about it. You're going to lie about that. I know you're going to lie about that. You remember when you were a kid, and maybe you got to be my age to, maybe, maybe they quit doing this after I quit being a kid, I don't know. But there was a saying that we all, finders keepers, finders keepers, losers weepers. See, that's, that's code for, I'm going to steal from you. If you drop it, I'm going to pick it up as mine. So, so just because someone lost it doesn't mean they gave it to you. And when they lost it, they're looking for it. You found it before they could found it, find it, so it's yours. How's it yours? Because it's theirs. If you keep it and it's not yours, then you stole it. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> oh, that's why I told you don't raise your hand. We steal at work all the time. That's so, oh yeah, you get out your, you, you're playing a game on your, playing a game on your phone, doing a little social media, upgrading your Instagram, I mean, updating your Instagram, Maybe, maybe you're playing a game on the computer, got a little solitaire going. You know what that is? That's stealing. Because you're on company time, supposed to be working for the company. That company time turns into company money, which you stole. Not you. Not you. Look down the row. That guy. <laughs> it's being dishonest. It's being dishonest about the amount of time you're actually working while you're on the clock. You know, when you clock in, you're supposed to work those hours. Or maybe taking a long lunch and not without permission or maybe taking a long lunch and and not making it up or maybe taking a long lunch realizing you're late and getting somebody else to clock you in mm. yes uh oh i just stepped on somebody or maybe taking so they got plenty of stuff maybe taking some stuff home that's company stuff for personal use i mean we could go on and on and on about this so we steal at work we steal from god you say how do you steal from god i mean when did i break into god's house and take his tv let me read it to you. Malachi, most of you know this. Some of you don't. Some of this will be brand new to you. But Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? So obviously we can rob God. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me, God says. But how, you say? How have I robbed you, God? He responds, in tithes and contributions. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to test, says the Lord of hosts, to see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down for you a blessing till there's no more need. Now you say, well, I tithe, I just give like, like 5%. See, the word tithe in the Hebrew means tenth. So if you give 5%, that ain't a tenth. I don't know what kind of math you did, but 5% is not a tenth. So, and, and you, got, you got quiet. <laughs> if you don't return to God what belongs to him, you're robbing him. And so it says here that, well, it says here that God's going to send a curse. You know, God's not in heaven with, with some pocket full of lightning bolts 
looking down, going, look, he's not gonna, he's not gonna tie. Pow! Ha, got you, sucker. You're gonna get sick, and boom, your car's gonna break. That was fun. Look over there, eight percent, nine percent. She's a little short. Pow! Boom, got her too. What a great day. That's not what it means. See, if you if you study the Old Testament, you find out that there are things that are devoted to God. The Hebrew word is karem. These certain things belong to God from the beginning. And for someone to take what is karim, someone to take what is dedicated or offered to God or for God's use only, that is stealing, stealing from God. Therefore, it's already precursed. So in a sense, when you write that tie check, you're getting the curse out of your house. Not if you don't write the tie check, he's throwing a curse at you. Did you all follow that? And so here's the deal. It says bring the full tithe. So if it's not 10%, it's not a tithe. Said another way, not giving God 10% is stealing. And it says, bring the full tithe where? Into the storehouse where you are fed from. So if you say, I give 5% to the local church and 5% to a nonprofit or 5% to a struggling friend, that's not tithing either. So I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just saying there is a way for us to steal from God. And and then we steal from God at home. And as soon as I say that, you go, oh man, I'm off the the hook now. Because he already nailed me at work. He nailed me at church, but I, but I ain't stealing from God at home. I know that because it's my house, all that stuff inside there is my stuff, and you can't steal your own stuff. Yeah, but, but you can pirate music. Mm. Oh my gosh, it just got real. You can pirate movies. You can pirate TV shows. You can pirate software. You can, go, you, you, you can get one of those sporting, those sporting packages this supposed that you sign a contract for that says is just for one household, like NFL ticket or at bat. Hello, anybody here? Mm, 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 mm. Y'all got quiet up in here. It says it's only for one person. You go, well, you know, and here's another thing. Why do you want the NFL ticket anyway? You don't need that. All you need is a Cowboys game. <laughs> Ow! So see, I don't have the NFL ticket. I can't steal that. But so, hey, could you give me your code so I can get on? That's what I'm talking about. That's stealing too. Say, man, are you sure about that? Listen, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, it says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Now, you got sins, which are one thing. You got abominations, which are way worse. So here he's saying, this this is the finer points of stealing. He said a false balance, I'll describe that to you in a moment, is not just a sin, it's an abomination to God. Like offering your children on the fire to Molech. Like, like on the, Molech, Molech was a, a, a fake god, it was, and, and they, 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 they built this steel contraption that, where they could build a fire inside of it and had arms out like that, and you put your children in it and they burned to death. That's an abomination. He said, Putting your children on the fire to Molech is an abomination. Here he says, the false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but the just weight is his delight. See, the point here is that God hates falsehood. Let me explain to you how this works. In, in back in those days, you shopped every day in the market for your daily needs. You, you shop every single day. And so you go into the market, and let's say that, that, let's say that you spy some dark chocolate-covered almonds. Mm, mm, mm. That's heavenly food right there. That and fried chicken will make it to heaven, I'm telling you right now. You're going to find that on the menu in heaven. So let's just say that you found some dark chocolate-covered almonds, and they're a dollar an ounce. Didn't say they were cheap now. So here's what happens. You say, I'll take one ounce. And so that means the guy that's selling the, the, the chocolates, he takes a one ounce weight and puts it in the scale, and it goes straight to the ground. And then he starts pouring dark chocolate-covered almonds in the scale until they get about even. See, what sometimes people would do is they'd get a knife and they'd hollow out that one ounce or that one pound or whatever weight. And then they would cover it over in the bottom so that it looks good, but watch this, watch this, but it doesn't have integrity. We're going to come back to that word in a moment. It doesn't have integrity. Sometimes they would shave the bottom off. So what happens is maybe they take enough stuff out of that ounce so it's really half an ounce. So then they put a half an ounce weight inside the scale. They put what you think is an ounce full of chocolate-covered almonds, but really it's only half an ounce. It equals, but you pay the full amount. You pay a dollar. It's stealing. It's falsehood. God hates falsehood. Let me, how about this? 
what, what do you call it when you go into a store like Target and you go to Target bag and there's nothing in it, but you go by a certain clothing section and you take something off the shelf, stick it in your, stick it in your Target bag and walk out the store without paying it. What do you call that? More particularly? Shoplifting. Okay. Now, so you get out, man, your heart's pounding because you're afraid you're going to get caught. You get to your car, I'm at, I made it. Not like I've had practice or anything. I'm just, <laughs> that, really, for real. I kind of talked myself into that one. So what happens if you go and you, you pick up six items in Target and you lay them on the conveyor belt, it goes to the cash register, and the lady rings up five of them. You pay for five of them, but she puts all six in the bag. Now, what happens when you walk out? You feel good about yourself. You don't know that to happen. You walk outside, you're on your way to the car, and security taps you on the shoulder. And can I see inside your bag, ma'am? You say, no problem. You open up your bag, they look inside, they got a receipt, one, two, three, four, five. They look at the items, one, two, three, four, five, six. What are they gonna do? They're gonna turn you around and march you back in that store. Now all of a sudden, your heart's pounding because they, they think I stole that. You gotta go inside and find the cashier to say, tell them I didn't steal that. Because it seems like, to the store that you did, but you know you did. Now let's go one step further. Suppose that you picked up six items in Target and you went to the line and you put them on the conveyor belt and it goes to the cash register and he, he, he checks in five of those and puts all six inside your bag and you get home and you open up your stuff and you're going through it and you count one, two, you, you look at the receipt and it's got one, two, three, four, five, items that you paid for, but it's got all six receipt, all six items that you picked up in the bag. So what do you do? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Well, you got a choice. You can steal it or you can go back and pay for it. You go, oh man, that is a drag. Look, Target makes so much money. Stop justifying your sin. If you keep it without paying for it, what did you do? Yeah, you accidentally shoplifted it. Mm. You didn't, but you, you, you get the point. You get the point. So we could go through all, we could talk about paying your taxes. We should have done this series in April because I would have nailed a whole bunch of y'all people. <laughs> I nailed you to, you would say, stop that in Jesus' name. I don't agree with everything the government does. It don't matter. The Bible says pay taxes to whom taxes are due. You say, they're not due them. Okay, skip April 15th, see if they're not due them. <laughs> we could talk about failing to, to put, failing to account for the, the cash that you made in some kind of sale or tips that you get if you're a waiter or a waitress. Sneaking into movies, dining and dashing. This even got a name for it, dine and dash. That's just bad. Fraudulent merchandising. That, 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 that's, where, that's where you had a little, you had a little fender, bender, fender bender, but you got it fixed. And you're selling your old truck, and the guy says, has it ever been an accident? And you go, uh, no. Uh-oh, you need next week's message, too. You lying and stealing. <laughs> so excessive interest, swindling, your the list just goes on and on. Here's the deal. I'm not trying to beat you up. We're not trying to beat you up here. We're not trying to make you feel bad about yourself or make you feel rejected or anything. We're trying to help you see that there's a bigger, the spirit of the law is bigger and God is after something in that. And, and when, you see, when you see what's on the other side of what we're talking about, it's, it's a really, really, really awesome gift from God. But listen, talking about stealing, anybody know the difference between an amateur thief and a professional thief? The amateur thief says, give me your money. The professional thief says, sign here. <laughs> that was terrible, wasn't it? I didn't write that joke. Someone gave me that joke. I didn't write that joke. It was in the, it was in the notes before I got them. Here's another one. Someone said, give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. Give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. <laughs> okay, if you're in banking, I apologize. Again, I did, not put that, I did not put that joke in there. I went to sleep. The joke wasn't there. I woke up. The joke was there. The devil did it. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. I stole it. Somebody else stole it. A thief walked, walked up to a man in a suit, put out his gun, and, and he said, give me your money. The man in the suit turned around, put up his hands, and he said, wait, you don't understand. I'm a congressman. So the man said, well, in that case, give me my money. <laughs> that was funny. That, that was funny. 
That was funny. That, that, that third one was funny. Okay, we talked about the letter of the law. Now, I got in trouble too. I noticed that. Y'all turned on me. That third joke got you back though. It's because you're a fickle crowd. We talked about the letter of the law. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the spirit of the law, integrity and generosity. Now, let me tell you, let me, let me, let me show you something that I hope you really get. If I asked you to define integrity, most people would say it means honesty. And that's part of it. But integrity is so much more. It's such an, it's such an integral and important character quality. Because when you look up the word integrity, and, and it, it, here's what it means. It means honest, yes, but it means solidarity. It means cohesion. It means wholeness. Integrity is basically the wall, the platform upon which every other character quality is built. Let me illustrate it for you like this. If you if you were here last week and we talked about don't look with the lustful intent at somebody, then you left, you said, I'm going to stop looking with lustful intent at people. What quality will enable you to stop that? Integrity. For you to make that decision, integrity is what empowers you to stop looking. So if, if we talked about next week, we talked about next week about lying and all the things that go with that. Again, we're not talking to you, but we are talking to your neighbors. So you should come and watch them squirm. It's going to be a lot of fun. But if you say, if you say I want to be a truth teller, what character quality is going to empower you to live out that decision? It's integrity. Integrity is the wall that holds every other character quality intact. It's what empowers those character qualities to become real in our lives. As it turns out, this thou shalt not steal has loaded inside of it the capacity for us to tap into that character quality of integrity and generosity, which can change our whole lives far beyond not taking stuff that isn't ours. Y'all see that? Isn't that cool? That's just cool. So integrity is choosing your thoughts and actions based on values, based on principles, rather than personal gain. So there's this story, and it's not a parable, it's a story, it's a true story that's happened to Jesus in the New Testament, Mark chapter 10, and it's called, the, it's called the, the rich young ruler. If you look in your Bible, it'll say the rich young, young, rich young ruler in the heading. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And as he, Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's thinking from the outside in, okay? What must I do outside to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Because there's no one good but God alone. So Jesus goes right to the heart. This is not about what you do, buddy. It's about your heart. But to drive the point even deeper, Jesus goes on. He says, he says you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Do not... Uh, honor your mother and father. And he said to him, teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. In other words, outwardly, I've done all these. I've never committed adultery. adultery. I, I don't steal. I'm in good shape here when it comes to those. He said to him, teacher, all these things I've done from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him and, and said to him, so Jesus is going to go, okay, now I'm going to shift from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law and go after your heart and see what's really in there. So Jesus, he's a genius. Jesus shifts gears and goes right for the heart. And, he, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. So he's not trying to hurt him. He's trying to help him like we're, like we're trying to do today. And he says, he says, one thing you lack, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, did Jesus really intend for him to go sell everything and give it to the poor? No. He was shooting at a deeper, deeper question. He was shooting at his heart. What he's really saying, what he's really saying is, this is not, this is not about the letter of the law. This is about the spirit of the law. This is about your heart, and I want you to know you failed the integrity and the generosity test. He didn't say that to him, but that's what happened because the man makes a choice, and the Bible says here that he went away. Um, he, he went away, where does it say that? He went away, whatever, upset, disheartened. There it is. Thank you. Y'all are not helping me. You're, you're paid to help me. You moan when the joke's not funny, but when I need a little help, you know, just leave me out there hanging. So the truth is, he may have, now watch this, he may have fulfilled he may have fulfilled the letter of the law, but what God wanted in his life was the capacity 
to live a life of, of, to live a life of freedom and joy right here on planet Earth. But he missed it. See, a lot of times we get this thing switched around. We tend to focus on doing while Jesus is focusing on being. We focus on the outward. Jesus is always after the inner. And so the truth is, if we'll do like he does and focus on the inner, if we'll focus on the quality that it takes not to, th- to steal, the quality that it takes that will, the, the character quality that will steer us away from stealing, if we'll focus on those things, then all of a sudden we focus on the inside, then the outside will follow. So our actions will follow. Integrity is who you are when no one's looking. It's one thing, it, it, it's one thing to, to live a certain way in front of people, but how, how are we when no one's looking? Here, let me ask you another question. How's your thought life? What, what's going on? Is your thought life all about me and mine and what I want and what I want to get? Or, or, or are other people and their best interests and their future and how you can serve them, is that part of your thought life? Because listen, whatever you focus on, whatever you think about, it's really going to affect you. Let, let, let me put it to you like this. Whatever you meditate on will become your future reality. I need to do a series on that. Whatever you meditate on becomes your future reality. You know, my oldest son has a saying, and I love it because it's just so true. He said, when it comes to computers, computers, the, the, the internet is a glass house. Somebody's always watching. But there's somebody bigger than the somebody who's watching on the internet, and that's God himself. It says in, second, in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 17, he says, I know, my God, that you examine our hearts. Not that just you see our hearts or take a peek at our hearts every now and then, but God, I know that you examine what's in here. You, you, we can't fake you by what's going on out here because you know that what's going on out here is really only a reflection of what's already gone on in here. So God, you, watch this now. I know, my God, you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. So God looks inside and he goes, there's integrity. That means there's a hope, there's a future for this person. Why is that? Because integrity is what holds all those character qualities Together, all those little decisions you make, Lord, I want to do this, I want to be that, I want to be the other thing. You ever find out that, the, that, that the, the willing is in your heart to do it, but the doing of it is not there? Can I just tell you why? We lack integrity. So if, if this commandment was given to help us learn that, then thank God for this commandment. So Jesus is after your heart, and he rejoices when you have integrity in it. When you align yourselves with his ways, when you align yourself with his principles. So I said there are two qualities. There's, there's integrity and there's generosity. Now I'm going to say something that may be a little bit surprising. Generosity has nothing to do with possessions and giving possessions away. When you hear generosity, you say, uh, you're going to go right for my money. You're going to go right for I got to give stuff to people. It's not about giving stuff to people. It's about your posture. See, generous people breathe the truth that they were made and, and they're blessed to be a blessing. Generous people know that their time, their talent, their treasure, their testimony was not just given by God to them for themselves, but that everything they have in life was given, the, given to them so that they could be a blessing to other people and that somehow in blessing other people, what they give away in terms of their time, their attention, their affection, their forgiveness, whatever the case may be, whatever they give away will be multiplied back to them. So then they're motivated to become all the more generous. And, and there's something powerful about that reality. They understand that the arrows are, are supposed to be pointing out not pointing at, what do you mean by that, Michael? Well, we're born with our arrows pointing toward ourselves. It's all about self, it's all about me, my life, my wife, my husband, my children, my money, my job, my future, my this, my that. It's all about me and mine. But Jesus didn't come that way. Jesus, his arrows pointed out. And one of my favorite passages in scripture is found in Philippians chapter two, where he talks about Jesus and it says, have this mindset in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was, he was equal with God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he became a servant. In other words, Jesus it was already God. He could have held on to it and not been selfish, but he said instead of holding on to what was already his, me and mine, he decided to put that aside and put you and me above himself. Have this mindset in you, it was also in Jesus. And when you read down that, it's actually a hymn. When you read down that hymn, at the very bottom it says, therefore God highly exalted him and gave him everything he ever dreamed about. 
That's the same with you. Have this mindset in you. Turn your arrows away from yourself. Turn them out. See, stealing says, I see it. I covet it. I want it. I don't care if I have to break the rules to get it. But generosity says, what I have from God, what I have from my family, what I have from, from just the way you made me is not for me. It's for somebody else. And when I give that away, God's going to give it back and he's going to multiply back to me and exalt me in those people's lives. Don't you? Everybody loves a generous person. Everyone scorns a stingy person. That's kind of a paraphrase of, a, of the Proverbs. So going back to this rich young ruler, this is what he missed. So he said, yo, Jesus, I'm not lying. I'm not committing adultery. I'm not stealing. I'm good, right? And so Jesus basically is getting at this. Yeah, but what are you giving to people? How are you making somebody else's life better? I mean, you're good, and you've been thinking about you. That's clear. You, got your, you look pretty good. But how are you bringing somebody else up to the level where you are? Are you giving to somebody? Are you sharing with somebody? Are you pouring your life into somebody? You're missing the whole thing. Son, you failed. You failed the heart test. You look good on the outside, but you failed the heart test. And that's why the rich young ruler walked away disheartened. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. You know, God loves us all. But when God says, I love that, I want to find out what that is and be it. Anybody else? God says, I love a cheerful giver. Why? Because this is a person, this is a person who gets the cross. The cross is not about me and mine. The cross is about dying to me, right? So Jesus died to himself so that we might have abundant life. So when you embrace the cross, it should change our hearts. And it should change these, eventually cause these arrows that point back at us to begin to point toward our wife and our husband and our kids and our friends and our neighbor and our coworkers and strangers and folks on the other side of the planet and folks who are hurting and folks who are needy. It, it, it really needs to do that. So with this, and, and let me just read on. So God loves that because he says, look, generosity. I can trust that person with more. If you're a generous person, God says, I can trust you with a whole lot more than you have right now. So I'm going to give you a whole lot more because I know I can trust you. Look at verse 8. And God is able to make, watch this. I'm going to exaggerate these words. And God is able to make all grace. How much is all? Pretty much all. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. What's he saying here? Generous people, I'm going to give them more because I can trust them. And what will they have in the end? They'll have all grace, all sufficiency, all things that they need sometime. No, at all times. Why? So they can abound in every good work. See, with this commandment, just like with the rest of the Ten Commandments, it's not thou shalt not steal. It's just not about the outward. It's about the heart. God is after our hearts. He wants us to have abundant life. He wants us to walk. He wants us to walk in this pathway of abundance and grace because he is the author of life. He knows how to walk in that way. He wants us to have that. So how do I do that, Michael? How do I walk into this? Well, you got to embrace his values. How do I do that? Well, there are two key values, and one of them is acknowledge him. Now, I'm not talking about the character qualities, integrity and generosity. How do I get those? Number one, you acknowledge him. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Now, hold on a minute. I thought I said that these commandments are a pathway into God's blessing for our life. So why has he got to make my path straight? Because my path is crooked by myself. My path is, so it, it presumes our, craft, our, our path is crooked. So he says, if you'll acknowledge, Michael, if you'll acknowledge me. When you get in a situation, you're not sure what to do, acknowledge me. Reference me, put me back in the middle, acknowledge me, and what I'll do is I'll straighten your path out. I'll fix your path. Watch what it says you. In all his ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. So what does God have to say about greed when you're feeling stingy? What does God have to say about tithing when you're not sure if you want to? What does God have to say about theft if you think about, ah, uh, what, 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 is, what does God have to say about integrity? What does God have to say about generosity? Whatever it is you're str struggling with, and, and, and it may not be what we're talking about today. There may be some other struggle in your life, but whatever it is that you're struggling with, acknowledge God. 
That means pray about it. Ask him, Lord, what do you think about what I'm getting ready to do? That, that alone will make your path straight. Half the time we don't pray because we know what we, well, that we shouldn't do it. We're going to do it anyway. And we don't want to talk to God because we don't want him looking over our shoulder going, mm-mm. So whatever it is, whatever area it is that you feel like you're struggling in, ask God and then embrace his values. Go to the scripture and embrace it and ask God before you ask anybody else. Other people's opinions do not matter. God's opinions matter. So lean into Jesus. Embrace his values by acknowledging him in everything and hide his word in your heart. Because listen, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be, your friend's got, man, we got NFL such and such. I'll tell you what, here's my password. Here's my my, user, my username, my password, go ahead, log into it. We'll watch together and, talk, and text over phone. And you're going to be tempted. How do you stand up to a buddy at work and go, ah, oh, it's kind of stealing, I can't do it. You're going to be tempted. It's not that big a deal, it's just one thing. I'll just go ahead and do it. You compromise your integrity. That wall that holds everything together, you just put chips in it. So you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted. And you're, and you're going to want to fail from time to time. So acknowledge him. Get him in the midst. And then number two, agree with him. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, it says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And when you think about repentance, you mean, oh, I should feel sorry. Actually, repentance has nothing to do with emotion. There may be times when you repent and you feel emotional about your repentance, which is fine. That's not bad. But, But repentance is an act of the will, not an act of the emotions. It means, it literally means, the word repent means to change your mind. It's a shift in direction. It means if I'm going this direction and I repent, I turn around and go this direction. So when I'm tempted to step, when I'm tempted to let my path get crooked and go in a direction God doesn't want me to go, and I step into it and realize, man, I don't want to go this way. This is not what God wants for my life. Not not the best for my life. As soon as I, as soon as I acknowledge that, then I agree with God, I can't go this way. And when I agree with God, I turn around and go toward him. What have I just done? I changed my mind. But what did I do? It's an R word. I repented. I was going to go the way I want to go. But then I realized, Lord, I acknowledge you. This is not the best thing. You know what? I agree with you. When I agree with you, I'm going to go your way. I've repented. And I'm back on the path that God wanted me to be on to start with. See how that works? This is not difficult. It really isn't difficult. In my being... And in my doing, I'm going to have to say the same things God's saying. I need to agree with him. I need to know what is right and what is wrong. I need to know what God thinks about it. And I need to go ahead and make the decision that I'm going to agree with you. Because I know you've got my best interest in mind. And the truth is, this is going to take practice. The truth is, the truth is that if you struggle with integrity and generosity and who doesn't from time to time, What's likely to happen is you're going to find yourself in situations where you can respond like yourself or you can respond like Jesus. And the the more often we respond like Jesus, the more often we choose him and not ourselves, the easier it gets to make that choice. And the next thing you know, choosing him becomes a habit and now you're really cruising. And that's the intention that God has for our lives. Let your values inform your actions and, and your being inform your doing. When tempted... Just say no to self. Just say no. Now, this commandment's not here to limit you. This commandment, just like all of them, is here to lift you, lift you into God's best for your life. Y'all remember Judas? Remember Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus? You know, he had a calling on his life. He was a disciple, and he was selected and called to be one of the 12 apostles. But you know, he's a thief. The Bible actually says that his job was to take the the money bag that funded Jesus' ministry, and from time to time he'd pilfer it. He'd take a little out, thinking one day he'd put a little back, but he didn't. Even the act of taking it, and I'll pay it back later when it isn't yours, that's stealing anyway. And the truth is, the truth is, he failed the integrity test, and it cost him his calling, and eventually it cost him his life. Jesus wants you and me, unlike Judas, to walk into his purpose, and to have his best for our lives. Let, let, let me just end this real quickly with, with this. It, it, it ends well. I, w- I want to end with the story, the second part of the story of the, of the rich young ruler. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth 
to enter the kingdom of God. And by the way, if you live in America, we are wealthier than 90% of the rest of the world. The poverty level is, 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 is our poverty level is 70% higher than everybody else. I'm not sure if I said that right, but you get the point. And the disciples were amazed at his words. And, and Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Surely he was trying to elicit a response. He goes one step further. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and it says, and they were exceedingly astonished. And they said, well, then who can be saved? Which tells me they considered themselves among the blessed, the rich, not the poor. Who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. It's going to require a heart transformation. And we can't make that happen. Only he can. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, you know, golly, man, I'm, I'm, I'm deeper in this than I thought I was. I'm a mess. I got this broken and that broken. Is there any hope for me? It is impossible for you to fix yourself. But the good news is Jesus died on the cross to get you fixed. He paid the price, and he can transform you from the inside out. The law was given to show us our incredible need for Jesus. And fulfilling these Ten Commandments, whether we do it by the letter of the law or by the spirit of the law, it's impossible to do on our own. And so thank God that we're not alone. Thank God that God is with us, and he's for us. Y'all, we can do this. We can be the people that God called us to be. We can be the people that God created us to be. We can be generous with men and women and men and women of integrity and, and wholeness with those strong platform of character built in our lives because we serve a God who has no limits, a God without limits. And he who began a good work in you, the Bible says he's going to complete it till the day of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Maybe you're in a place where you just need to repent right now. And I just, it just under your breath, not out loud, you just say, Lord, help me with this integrity thing. I struggle with this. And on my own, I can't fix myself. He loves to hear that. Because when you give up, that's when he begins. When our strength is gone, his strength begins. So just tell him, Lord, I give up trying to fix myself. I need you. Lord Jesus, I need you and your power in my life to fix me, to set me right. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your head bowed for one more moment for one more prayer. Maybe you're here at one of our sites and or watching on the internet, on your smartphone or something, and you realize in your heart you're not right with God. And, and all this message did was just further confirm that. And you're wondering, what am I going to do? I'm outside of the favor of God. I have no relationship with God. I thought I did, but I know I don't now. What am I going to do? If you'll repent and trust, God will open a door of relationship to you. And you say, well, how do I do that? Maybe you thought you've done it before, but you know now it wasn't real. So you're asking the question, how do I do that? How do I repent and trust? In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to lead the prayer out loud, and we're all going to pray the prayer together. And I just need to know who wants me to include them in that prayer. You say, Michael, would you pray for me that I might repent and trust him? We certainly will. And if that's you and you say, include me in that prayer, just slip your hand up right where you are. I will not embarrass you. I'll not ask you to leave your seat. I'll see your hand and I'll include you in the prayer. Thank you back here. It's just that difficult. Right over here too also. If you'll keep your hand up long enough for our host team to make their way to you, they're going to put a gift in your hand. And it's a CD. It's, it's, it's six minutes long. It'll, it talks about your relationship with God and the five key elements about that relationship with God. And so if you're saying you want Jesus Christ in your life, you just raise your hand, hold it up, for our host team are going to make their way to you. And, uh, and then we're going to lead in this prayer. So anybody else want to get in? I see hands up over here. Anybody else want to get in this prayer other than those who've already raised their hand? Just slip your hand up right where you are, and I'll see it, and I'll include you in this prayer. Anybody else? Awesome. Okay, let's all pray together. Ready? Say, Jesus. Come on, better than that. Jesus, thank you for that cross where you paid for all my sins. I acknowledge I've sinned against God. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. I repent. I turn from sin to you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. From this moment forward, I'm going to follow you forever. 
Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give a hand to those who raise their hands. Best decision you made in your entire life. God bless you.